morning, everyone. I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year and a belated Christmas. Um, today, we are going to look at the book of John. And um, I'd like to ask everyone here a question that you, I know all of us has faced every day or in our lives. What did it, does it mean to say to your girlfriend or your wife or your husband or to your children that I love you? In your hearts, you ex the expression of your love to your children is pure and unadulterated. Today we will look at how the Word of God differentiates between how we put devotion to our Savior in the context of our objectivity. When I talk about objectivity, I'm not talking about the mind. I'm talking about how we express ourselves from our hearts. When I looked at John in chapter 12, I was astonished by this one verse, which is in John chapter 12, 3. Anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I ask you all here, sorry. What does this conjure up in your hearts? I've always looked at the Gospels and I always imagined myself standing there in the background and witnessing these acts and being filled with the overwhelming and overpowering onslaught of my senses. But at the end of it all, there's a sudden and stark awakening in my surroundings. And I ask myself what I would do or say if I had been the witness of such an act. John chapter 12 verse one begins a major transition in John's gospel. He begins his account of Jesus' last and final week, which concludes on the cross. The seven day period that begins here is the most significant week in history. The seven days of creation parallel this. In the earlier chapter, in chapter 11, we see the momentous event of Lazarus being raised from the dead. There are significant theological points displayed in that event that outlines Lazarus resurrection. One of these include how many Jews that saw the miracle and were drawn to Jesus, which caused the authorities to put their plan into the action which ultimately led to the cross. The key people, apart from Jesus in chapter 11, that play a significant role in chapter 12 are Lazarus, Mary, Judas, the chief priests, and the Pharisees. There are three contrasting character personalities that portray the significant divide in the human character when looking through the lens of God. It shows the choice in our life that determines our faithfulness to Christ. In chapter 11, we see Lazarus being raised and the witness and the focus of the miracle. There we see Mary and how she confronted Jesus when he arrived in John chapter 11, verse 32. And when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Her acknowledgement that of the power of Jesus and her submission to his presence, she acknowledged that if Jesus had been there, her brother would not have died. Her submission to fall to his feet, even when her brother had already died. Next, we see that even when we do not see Judas mentioned in chapter 11, we know with certainty that he was there and was witness to all that had, had happened. Because Judas's action in chapter 12 are an unmistakable evidence of his twisted and distorted view. Then we also see the chief priests and the Pharisees plot a diabolical plan to eliminate Jesus and Lazarus. The target is Jesus who now threatened the position of those wicked men as written in John 11 verse 48. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, 
and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. This led them to make final plans for his death in verse 53. For, so from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So the stage is set. We see in the next chapter how one act of pure devotion could represent the landscape of human depravity in our hearts. How can we be so easily fooled by our own perception of devotion? This is prescribed within our own sufficiency to act subjectively without any objective faith. We act from our heads, but not from our hearts. Before we begin, let us pray. Father in heaven, help us today to see the true nature of ourselves and convict us in our folly. Help us to see if our life has been in submission to your glory or are we still influenced by the world around us. Help us, Father, to see the nature of our steadfast, of your steadfast promises and never-ending love, even when we are stubborn and defiant. In your Son, Jesus Christ, we see the love and grace displayed as the reflection of your glory. Help us see your word and understand the manner of our lives are lived, which glorifies you. We are seeking your help and conviction to place us upon a path of a life that is devoted to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and guide us in our life and enable us to walk upright and steadfast that reflects and glorifies you. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us take our Bibles and turn to John chapter 12. And we'll be looking at John chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. We see how John had also recorded the first seven days of Jesus' ministry in chapter 1, from verses 19 to 51. And here, we see how John records the importance of Jesus' final week. We see John devoting almost half of his gospel to it. A characteristic we see reflected in other gospels as well. When we combine the narratives of the other Gospels, we can arrange a rough chronology of Jesus' last days. On Saturday, he dined with Lazarus and his sisters. On Sunday, Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem. On Monday, he returned to Jerusalem, cursing the barren fig tree. On Tuesday, his last public preaching in Jerusalem concluded with Jesus' seclusion in the Mount of Olives giving the Olivet Discourse to his disciples. On Wednesday, he stayed again in Bethany, returning to the city. On Thursday, he observed the Passover with his disciples, after which he was arrested. On that night and morning, Jesus was tried, and on Friday, he was crucified. I find it interesting to observe the difference between what John records as compared to the content of other Gospels. While Matthew, Mark, and Luke Focus mainly on Jesus' public events, John writes of the intimate fellowship that Jesus enjoyed with his close circle of disciples. This also relates to the difference in witnessing Mary's actions during this time. John provides a clear, intimate visual testimony outlining details that present an in-depth view of the unfolding story. And this is a staple of, the gos of his Gospels while the rest provide a clear and concise unfolding of Jesus' life and his works, John seems to have enjoyed Jesus' intimate affection, and his gospel dwells on the theme of fellowship with Christ. For my sermon today, I've titled it, The Sweet Aroma of Devotion, and I've separated the passages into four themes. First is devotion framed, followed by devotion confronted, and then devotion intimidated, and finally devotion honored. Let us begin by looking at what, at when Jesus had been staying away from Jerusalem until the time came for his dramatic entry on Palm Sunday. Here we see it, we see as that time drew near, he returned to Bethany 
His coming was greeted with joy and thanksgiving for the recent event of Lazarus' resurrection, which leads us to our first theme, devotion framed. To celebrate Jesus' return, in verse 2, they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. The banquet provides a lovely display of different believers offering various acts honoring our Lord. Martha's gift was service, and she offered it gladly. Risen Lazarus served as a witness of Jesus' saving power, so he sat next to him at the feast. Mary was known for her deep devotion to Jesus. John recounts this in verse 3. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The verse records one of the most beautiful scenes from the life of Jesus. Mary stands out for her display of loving devotion, displaying four features of devotion to Christ that all of us should emulate. First, Mary's devotion was courageous. Chapter 11 concluded with the religious leaders saying in John chapter 11 verse 57, Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. One who failed to do this would likely be accused as an accessory alongside Jesus. Yet Mary and Lazarus and others openly hosted Jesus for this meal. As we learn, Lazarus was in danger as well since the rulers sought to eliminate him as evidence of Jesus' miracle. Nonetheless, these courageous disciples placed their devotion to Christ ahead of their own safety. Second, Mary exhibited a costly devotion. She took a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard to anoint Jesus, a bottle of perfumed oil of highest quality. Judas claimed that his value was 300 denarii, a year's wages for a worker, or tens of thousands of dollars in today's currency. This was expensive oil of the very highest quality. Some commentators conclude that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus must have been, must have been wealthy if this is the case, they set a good example for those with great financial means today. One of the dangers of wealth is that it creates an appetite for pleasure and valuable things. Statistics show that rich people tend to give away a smaller portion of their money than poorer people do. But Mary was not this way. If she could afford valuable things, she also did not hesitate to give them lovingly to Jesus. But it's also quite possible that Mary was not a wealthy person. This jar of oil might have been a family legacy or a unique treasure that she had acquired. Whatever the case, her devotion was such that she was delighted to offer the very best she had to show her love for his, her master. Thinking nothing of herself, she found her great delight in giving her, every be her very best to Jesus' blessing. Mary's gift challenges us regarding the price we are willing to pay as disciples of Jesus. What is your most treasured possession? Is it your stock portfolio? If so, then one way you can place Jesus first is to give sacrificially from your treasured assets out of love for Him. Is it your lifestyle? Then you should consider giving up recreation to do service in the church or share the gospel with others. Is it the standard of living you provide to your family which you would not give up going into full-time Christian work? Or is it the self-image that the worldly acceptance provides you so you will not boldly, boldly defend yourself as Christians? If so, you should examine your heart and recalculate the value of the Lord. Jesus Christ drawing near to him to cultivate the costly devotion of Mary. What is that propagating an affection for your God? What is it? 
The human mind seeks every avenue to justify anything we want to do. We seek reason and meaning in all our actions. Does devotion to God need justification? I ask you. God's greatest gift to you, a verse we all know by heart and sometimes forget the depth of its meaning and how it's supposed to convict us in our lives. For God so loved this world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How do you even compare your mortal values against such an unsurpassed gift of your loving God? What are we willing to give up for our devotions to our God? Our materialism binds us so that anything we do is governed by our choices and reasoning and not through the lens of God. Can there be a, more, be a manner of your life whereby we realize that what we have here is only a testing ground of your faith and love to God? But there is much more awaiting us in His promises in the kingdom to come. Paul knew this and sought that future to be with the Savior in Philippians chapter 2, verse 23. I'm hard pressed between the two, my desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Can you set aside your mortal governance and see the promises that awaits us as faithful Christians? What a blessing it is when our awareness of the priceless love of Christ has set us free from our need to possess people and things. If we have Jesus, we have everything we could ever want or need. But sometimes we must let go of other things we love to recognize the preciousness of Christ. A gift from the heart is the most precious gift ever. The same gift that is found on the cross. How we recognize gifts starts with our hearts and the manner that we view the world through our lens which leads me to my next theme. Mary was a humble devotion. The use of perfume was customary for special events. This was a time when bathing was infrequent and hot climate produced body odors. A host would place a dab of oil on the head or face of a guest. But Mary's devotions were such that she did, not, she did far more for Jesus. With Jesus reclining on the lower table and his legs extended forward, Mary proceed, proceeded to anoint not only Jesus' head, but also his feet. This is noteworthy because it was considered beneath people to wash the feet of others. Even enslaved people had rights. Mary did not hesitate to wash and anoint Jesus' feet. Mary gave up her rights before the Lord. There's nothing he cannot ask of her. Touching his feet became, becomes her pledge of unconditional service. Mary's humility before Jesus undoubtedly arose from her awareness of who he was. If she had previously known his raising of her brother proved his deity as the son of God. So for Mary, her any, any service to Jesus was an honor and pleasure an occasion to worship and show thanks for what she, he had done. She was like John the Baptist who said in John chapter 1, verse 27, Even he who comes before, after me, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. John meant that the most menial thing he could do for Jesus is not beneath him, but above him. So glorious and great is the Lord Jesus Christ. In contrast, those who hold back from service to Christ, especially humble service, can only be those who have not comprehended the grace and glory of God in the face of Christ. Mary's devotion to Christ was more than humble. It was also extravagant. If the disciples who looked on were amazed when she anointed Jesus' feet, they were shocked 
when she wiped his feet with her hair. It was scandalous for a woman to unbind her hair in public during those times. A married woman could be divorced by her husband for this, and a single woman could be stoned. For a woman to let down her hair, expressing hair expressed intimacy, openness, and fervent love. And it was done only in the privacy of homes and close family members. So by unbinding her hair, Mary was and using it to wipe Jesus' feet, Mary expressed a completely surrendered devotion in which nothing was held back. She knew she was completely safe in his holy presence, and seeing him as his as her divine Lord, she desired that nothing stand between her devotion and Jesus. But where did Mary get this devotion? The answer is found in every gospel account in which she is often sitting at Jesus' feet. Mary had turned attention to Jesus, had noted how different he was from everyone else, and had listened to his teachings and had given him her heart. Everyone who draws near to Jesus this way will also find the kind of devotion for him that Mary displayed. Whatever we can do, we also should not, we should do it out of our hearts, surrendered to Jesus. No matter what the world tries to dissuade us from Christ, which brings me to my next theme, the confrontation face amidst Mary's devotion. Devotion confronted. It is sometimes quipped that no good deed goes unpunished. Whether that is true or not, indeed, genuine devotion to Christ seldom goes unchallenged. So it was for Mary in verses 4 to 5. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this anointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Here is a challenge that is frequently made against Mary's passionate devotion to Jesus. It is better, and many would argue, to do good practical work instead of spending time with the Lord. The Spirit is very, very much alive here today and everywhere. Preachers hear people complain about sermons focused on the conviction of sin and the glory of Christ rather than the practical needs of their own lives. I've had people come up to me and say that my sermon was a Bible lesson with no practical application. The Word of God did not make them think or convict them. There was a self-centered need of being able to take it home and reflect. I found it strange that expository sermons revealing the voice of God and how it applies to our lives would have to be given to fit someone's narrative. God's Word is unchanging and can only, be, can only be seen through your lens and not through the preacher's lens. The Word of God changes people's lives. It either humbles or hardens their hearts. Either way, God's Word is working. Faithful sermons expositing God's Word are not governed by man on the pulpit or by the faithfulness of his sermon to God's Word to those who listen but by the faithfulness of his sermon to God's word. Hence, when we devote our lives to listening, we seek depth in his message. For if not today, God has his time and place to convict us and remind us of his word. Whatever time or treasures we offer up to exalt the glory of Jesus, some will complain that it could have, done, it could have been better used for the interests of man, especially when it comes to his word. Many people echo Judas's opinion today, but little realizing whom they are quoting. What a contrast he, represent, he presents to Mary, who viewed everything from the aspect of the glory of Christ. But there is a second objection to Mary's devotion to Jesus, one that Judas is often employed to mask. And here John states in verse 6, Judas said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag he used to help himself to help himself to put 
to what was put in it. Judas proves how cleverly a hypocrite can play a role of a disciple, even entrusted with high privileges. It is interesting that Jesus, who surely knew that Judas was a thief if John did, should nonetheless place Judas in charge of the money donated to the support of the disciples. Jesus was evidently no, no more afraid of what Judas might do by stealing, but by what Judas would do by betraying him. Mary's devotion offended Judas because his focus in religion was on how much he could gain for himself. <coughs> Excuse me. We should be warned if there are signs of Judas' stinking in our hearts. Coming to church without any devotion to Jesus, seeking our own presupposed agendas. Judas' greed led him to betray Jesus, making his name one of the most reviled names in all of history, and ultimately costing him his very soul. And Jesus spoke out to defend Mary in verse 7 and 8. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus was not speaking callously about the poor. Rather, he argues that our concern for the problems of this world should not displace our worship of the Savior from heaven. Since Jesus was about to die on the cross, the very best use of the oil was anointing of his body. Indeed, it is probable that through all the events to come, Jesus' arrest, his unjust trial, his cruel murder, his burial in the tomb, that the fragrance of Mary's devotion still clung to his body. In the next theme, we see how secular life threatens our devotion, how the world around us tries to influence and distract us from God. Devotion intimidated. The account of Jesus' anointing provides a model of devotion and answers a challenge to, de to devotion to him. But devotion to Jesus is also threatened with deadly violence in verses 10 and 11. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. If devoted Mary threatened Judas's conscience, the resurrected Lazarus threatened the hostile Jewish leaders far more. Her devotion offered a lasting memorial to the divine glory of Christ. Lazarus' witness offered a memorial to his divine power of Christ. Indeed, as people learned that Jesus had returned to Bethany, they were just as fascinated to see Lazarus as they were to see the Lord. And John states that in verse 9. When the large crowd, when the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Lazarus was an unlikely star witness for Jesus as the Messiah. Nothing outstanding about him is ever recorded in the Gospels, and he never says anything worth recording. So what is it about Lazarus that makes his witness so powerful? The answer is not in what Lazarus did for Jesus. It is in what Jesus did for Lazarus. And the same is true for every Christian today. If we are dead in our sins, and if over us a voice from above were to say, come forth, and if you have risen to newness of life, and the voice says, unbind him let him go so that now we are free then we have become living proof for jesus christ lazarus was a threat to the rule of the leaders who hated jesus as well as a fragile peace they sought for the, with the romans for this reason the fact that he had so publicly died and had and been raised by jesus was a serious problem for them the scholar J.C. Ryle writes, They could not deny the fact of his having been raised again, living and moving, eating and drinking within two miles of Jerusalem. 
after laying four dead four days in the grave Lazarus was a witness to the truth of Jesus' messiahship whom they could not possibly answer or put to silence and for this reason in verse 10 the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well if you remember in verse in chapter 11 Caiaphas had declared in John 11 verse 50 they would better for one man to die for the nation but here we see there would be two my brothers and sisters before Caiaphas's of history are finished millions of Christ followers will die for their witness to Jesus yet not one Christian death will effectively stop the spread of the gospel Christians should not be surprised to be similarly threatened for their Christian witness burying the evidence is a tactic as ancient as Caiaphas and as modern as today's modern media but realize that it's only the guilty who takes such a course of action and since and since Satan once above all to bury or at least obscure the evidence of God's saving power at work in this world. Christians not only should be zealous to give their witness, but should feed their own faith on the proofs of the claim of Christ, both those in the Bible and those living amongst us in the church today. So does your faith in Christ challenge others to consider the gospel? Is your godly life threatening to unbelief are you able to tell people why they should believe in Jesus or are they able to find are, and are they able to find convincing proof of salvation in your conduct if we continue in the noble line of Mary and Lazarus we can be certain that others will see the truth of Jesus in our lives and what was said of Lazarus will be said of us as in, loves, in, as, in love, as in verse 11 on account of him many were believing in Jesus and finally what is the result of this unyielding devotion to our Lord God which is our, in our next theme devotion rewarded the devotion for Jesus that was modeled by Mary challenged by Judas and threatened by the corrupt leaders was richly rewarded by the Lord one reward of devotion to Christ is seen in Mary's apparent understanding of his saving passion mission in Mark's gospel Jesus defends Mary lavish outpouring of expensive oil by stating in Mark chapter 14 verse 8 she had done what she could she has anointed my body beforehand for, bo for burial the reward of devotion to Christ is seen in one last detail that John provides from this lovely episode he writes that after Mary anointed Jesus' feet and washed them with her hair as she moved about in verse 3 the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume her devotion to Jesus was fragrant and wherever she went the aroma of her gift to Jesus was spread what greater reward could we have than this and what greater blessing could we give to others if we see Jesus in his divine glory and grace and if we break the walls of our hardened hearts to pour out in devotion to him then our lives will bear the fragrance of his salvation spreading the gospel mercy wherever we go there can be no greater reward than to be used in this way to share the glory of Christ in the world knowing that we pour out our devotion to him he will pour out through us the grace of his gospel for the salvation for those we know and love it is the fragrance of our devotion expressed outwardly inspired by the Holy Spirit to see the bountiful endless loving grace of our loving God the fragrance that comes from our lifestyle continues to be the aroma of sweet fragrance to our Lord 
From the Old Testament sacrifices offered with a sweet fragrance to our Lord. It represented our conviction in our lives to our God. Today in Jesus, we in the manner we live our lives and worship, honor of God, produces the fr sweet fragrance to our Lord God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul states, states, To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are the aroma of Christ to God. Paul can describe himself in these ter terms because by preaching of God's word, he spreads abroad the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ. Paul extends the metaphor to describe two possible responses to gospel preaching by adding the words, among those who are saved and among those who are perishing. During the Roman times, the, they used to burn incense during long parades, especially during when they conquer a new city or a town or a place. And during the victorious parade, the victorious general and his soldiers and all the welcoming crowds, the aroma would be associated by the burning incense that was burnt during the, the victory parade. But there are two reflections to this aroma. Because for the prisoners of war, the aroma could only be associated with the fate of slavery or death which awaited them. In like fashion, then the preaching of the gospel would be a fragrance from life to life for those who believe, but a fragrance from death to death for those who refuse to obey it. Either way, the choice is yours. We say we want and desire, but we continue to fall short. My brothers and sisters, you have to remember the problem is that we cannot, and it's only through God's loving grace that we are able to. We must put away our old selves and allow the Spirit of God to point us to the cross, that we become the empty vessels through which the light of Christ shines forth. Unless, like Paul reminds us in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, unless we have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives through us. And the life we live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My brothers and sisters, we see how Mary openly gave up herself to the point of expression that we, even in today's context, would find, would find stunning. It would. I asked you earlier at the beginning what it meant to you when you said I love you said I love you to your to your husband or your spouse or your children. Are we in the same league as Mary? We are talking about human love, filial love. God defines love as agape love, the giving up of self the expression seen on the cross where Christ himself gave himself for you. We celebrated Christmas, the coming of our Lord. What greater gift than that? Thank you and God bless.